At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at KeelyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. In our nearly 700 trips into the Live Inspired Podcast together, we have brought you thought leaders like Martin Luther King III and astronauts like Jim Lavelle and award-winning entertainers like Lauren Daigle or Jonathan Cain from the band Journey. In other words, we brought you individuals who have made it. These are individuals who have certainly weathered their seasons of storms and struggles, and yet they've come out the other side victorious. They've made it. And yet what I know to be true in my story and certainly in yours is that many times as we journey through our lives, we don't have that sense of making it. We're in the midst of the storm. We're in the midst of a season of struggle. And that's why we wanted to bring you today a guest who is also enduring their own season of figuring it out, of enduring a period of struggle. They have a vision of where it's going next. They have a process to get there. And yet they're in the middle of the struggle. My friends, our guest today's name is Patrick Young. That might be a name that you're familiar with because he is a former basketball standout. He is a two-time SEC Defensive Player of the Year, and yet he faced the unimaginable, tragic, difficult challenge of, in 2022, enduring a car accident that left him paralyzed from his waist down. This once towering athletic man who stood almost six foot nine no longer is able to stand. This once professional athlete who had the world at his fingertips is no longer able to jog onto the court. This man who once was just about a week and a half out from his wedding date has lost that relationship with what he thought was the love of his life. It's in a period of storm and struggle and crisis right now. And yet, my friends, what he will reveal to us during this time together is what it looks like in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of not knowing, to shut your eyes, to keep the faith, to move forward, and to believe with complete certainty and conviction that the best is yet to come. Leaders today, Patrick joins us to share his journey as he faces continually the adversity of each day as he embraces his renewed purpose in life this story is a guiding light reminding us to focus on what we can control, to let go of what we can't, and to find joy in the simplest of moments. My friends, if you've ever wondered how in the midst of the storm you could continue to weather the difficulties of the day, then this conversation with my friend Patrick Young is for you. So without further ado, let me loop him in. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Young, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. John, it's awesome to be here. It's crazy how the universe works in mysterious ways. I never thought I'd be hopping on your podcast. I've just been a fan from afar and now getting a chance to connect with you and, and hopefully I can continue on and inspire somebody else today. That, that'll be awesome. Well, dude, you've inspired me already to such a degree that we are 32 minutes into our time together and I finally hit record. So I'm now looping the audience into a conversation that I've already loved with a man who I've long looked up to and now completely love. So Patrick, man, I, I want to begin with, if I were to meet you in a grocery store and I say, Patrick, tell me about yourself. 
How do you answer that these days? I would say, hey, buddy, uh, my name is Patrick Young. I'm a Duval native, Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a I'm a Jaguars fan. I'm a Gator. Uh, more than anything, um, I love God. I've been able to uh, do a lot of awesome things as a basketball player. If you've heard, you notice that I'm six foot nine. I'm a really big guy. Uh, I did play. I played basketball professionally, and in and in college for my dream school, University of Florida, was able to play um, in NBA for a cup of tea. <laughs> uh, maybe a sip of tea uh, when I was in the NBA and then I went overseas to play in Europe for some time and got to really experience some great culture over there on a personal note now being retired I love hanging out with friends I love just being present I love experiences more than things I love food and I love dogs love my family and I have a wonderful 12 year actually today is her birthday 12 year old little nugget that is growing up faster than I'd want her to one thing that while we're in the aisle of that grocery store, you did not mention is you're in a wheelchair while you're sharing with me these things about your present and about your little nugget and about the things you love and about your relationship with God, about the incredible success you've had as a basketball player, all from the position of a wheelchair now. Yeah. And it wasn't always the case. And I, I want to, I want to tell, I think the story that makes you so bold today, because you've been slowly led to this place. Like you, your character yeah. and your faithfulness have guided you forward to be able to embrace this cross. Foundationally, I will say foundationally for sure. I know your parents were foundational, like mine were yeah. in my life, yours were in your life. Just talk about what you learned from your mother growing up and then separately what you learned from your father. Well, I'm still learning from them today to this day. My parents, uh, they'll be 40 years married this upcoming December, which is rare these days that people stay married that long. And I've seen them grow and change throughout the years and just have a healthy perspective, I think, of how hard marriage is, but how it can still work. And my dad, growing up, his dad was a big time worker, provider, kind of the older school definition we look at as a provider for a family. I show you how I love you through my work and through what I put on the table and providing in that way. So I think my dad definitely didn't get filled up as in his cup of love as much as he could have through his dad um he knew he loved him he loved him though and supported him and wanted the best one without a doubt as every parent does and his mom my grandma she disciplinarian i like it when he says this she didn't play the stereo like she did not play she did not mess around so it's really important for us to strive we you know as we sometimes become critical of our parents and where they didn't do this and didn't do that you know, you have to think about their upbringing and then their parents' upbringing and so on and so forth. And my dad decided when he's going to be a dad one day, he was going to be a full-time supporter to his kids as much as possible. My dad was a football guy, first off. So he wasn't a basketball guy, wasn't a baseball guy. Yet he poured in, like when I played baseball, which is my first sport, we were in the backyard pitching, working on stuff, hitting it in the net taking me to coaches, taking me to tournaments, taking me all the things growing up. Church was a huge part thing for us. Something We went every Sunday and, and that foundation was huge, pivotal in, in my in my growth. And I think more so when I got older, when I uh, started making some bonehead mistakes and realized that I needed guidance. My mom was a night nurse and she works. And I just remember irritating her so much during the day when she's trying to catch her sleep. But my mom is sweet. She is loving. She's caring. She is eccentric. She's one of one. My mom was not a difficult child in the way of discipline. My mom was a difficult child because she was so excellent. And just coming from my grandparents' background, they grew up poor, didn't have a lot of things in Georgia, came down. And then they have this one kid of the four that only wants to read, only wants to learn, only wants to do excellence. And it, it's crazy. In middle school, the teacher came home to my grandparents and told her, your daughter needs to go somewhere else. I can't teach her. She's that smart. <laughs> so uh, that's where the academics on the side of me come from. And they've continued to teach me so many things and just the way that they carry themselves and live day by day. And hopefully I've taught them a thing or two as well. I know you grew up a pretty tall kid, obviously, you ended up being 6'9", almost 6'10", but baseball was your first love. You threw up Baseball was first love, man. At one yes. point. When did you decide, you know what, I love baseball, but I'm, I'm going to pursue basketball? It, it's crazy. Things kind of lined up in life where 
I was still playing baseball and basketball up to about 16 years old. And my AAU coach in baseball, he, he wasn't a player's coach. He kind of helped, helped make the decision for us, honestly, because I'm playing basketball and baseball in the summer. And you got tournaments that sometimes match up at the same time as this or that. He just got upset that I, there was a tournament I could make because of basketball, but I could make one the next week. And his his frustration with us trying to be flexible and my parents are paying the money <laughs> for both of these things. At this point at 16, I already started getting a lot better at basketball anyway. So the real nail in the head was when I started slipping on my grades my junior year. I had already committed to the University of Florida to play basketball at this point, but I came home one semester right before baseball season with like five C's on my report card. And my mom said, you're not average. So why are you accepting it? If this is how you're going to show up, then something needs to change. And she made me decide right there. She's like, you're, you're playing basketball or baseball. So Billy Donovan is, I mean, kind of a coach's coach. He's just, yeah. even folks who don't truly follow basketball know Billy Donovan. Yeah. You, you were a McDonald's All-American. You were pursued by an awful lot of universities. Could have played almost anywhere. Why did you choose to play under him and at Florida? Big part of it, uh, my grandparents, in, in terms of instilling that love for Florida in my heart. And it's it, interesting because they, they, they're they from Georgia. Why were they not Georgia Bulldog fans? Um, I don't know. But growing up as, oh, man, recruiting is so overwhelming. I was not recruited at all until after I went to this camp. I come back. I got to say there were 100 letters, 100 letters that I laid on my bed from <laughs> universities all around. And I wanted my recruiting process to be over quick. Coach Donovan was coming off of those two national championships. It was really the easy choice for me. He wanted me so badly, made that clear. I didn't really even talk to my family too, too much about it. We went on an unofficial trip at a game and I'm like, what am I waiting for? I want to come here. And he was pretty excited about that. So there's games that we could talk about. There's plays that we could talk about. And dude, I think the thing that impresses me most is you played, what, 150 college games? Yeah. Never missed a game during your four years? I played in 150 games. We won three SEC regular season titles. I won Defensive Player of the Year. We were the first team to go 18-0 and in the SEC my senior year. Final four, three Elite Eights in a row. Uh, we won an SEC tournament. I was multiple all-SEC teams throughout that that time. First, first ever, this is one of the things I'm most proud of, academic SEC player of the year, three times in a row. No one's ever done that before. But the thing is, my freshman year, and I actually heard Inky Johnson talk about this today, which is so good, expectations versus standards. I had all these expectations, which are external. Those are other people putting those, those things on yourself. Patrick Young's going to be this, he's going to be that. And it's, it's nice that people see that potential in you to become great. No one's thinking about, the messy parts in the middle, they're just like, oh, that dude can get to, yes. if he does all. And then there's a standard where it's internal. I'm going to work my butt off. I'm going to be a sponge. I'm going to learn everything. I'm going to squeeze every ounce of potential I have. And I, I didn't have that. I thought it was going to be a lot easier when I got to college. Hmm. It's overwhelming. First time you have a real training program in the weight room where they kick your butt all the time. Then you've got the individual workouts on the court. you got scouting. You got to learn defense, offense, these terminology. You got class. You got study hall, let alone food that you're training table. You got to figure out where everything is. And it's freshman year. And then you want to have somewhat of a social life. And it just always overwhelming to me. And it showed up in frustration on the court in practice. And I, I bring all that to say because I, I gave context of all the things that happened when I was there. But those things almost didn't happen hmm. because... I was being, I became a distraction because of my frustration, because I didn't have a standard. I didn't have an understanding. I didn't get it that in order to get to where I wanted to get, to, I, I had no idea what I didn't know. And that my frustration became uncoachable. Coach Donovan had to sit me down in his office at my freshman year and said, Patrick, I love you to death, but if you don't let me coach you, you should think about transferring someone else. Patrick, you just pause for a moment. Like you seem like the most coachable guy. I know, man. And I don't know if that's the way you reveal yourself today or if that's just kind of your your character. 
but uh, it's, you strike me as being the most coachable kid ever. I didn't get it. I didn't understand criticism. I didn't understand it's not personal. We don't do such a great job as a country just raising our kids to understand criticism isn't perfect. First off, all the criticism may not be right, but there could be some truth in something someone's telling you. And it, it's not, usually it's not a personal attack. And I just, I took them as personal attacks and it, I wasn't able to flip the switch, a missed call, a missed foul. I'm stuck on that instead of being able to move on to the next play. And to an extent, I would say I almost wasted my freshman year. Hmm. What do you wish you would have known? I wish I would have known in order to get to where I want to get to, you got to have a level of hunger, a level of humility, and a level of competition, daily competition of striving, because that's what winners do. Winners don't get complacent. Winners don't think they ever have it all together. Winners don't say, and I'm talking about the ones that remain on top, Tom Brady, LeBron James, those guys have a standard that's not just short term it's a legacy and you can look back with regret and say oh i wish i could have done this differently and that differently and blah 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 life would be different of course would it be better i can't say that i wouldn't be the man that i am now without the mistakes you know man I, we could spend two podcasts talking about basketball i know right final fours at elite eights at donovan style and everything else we could talk about Europe and your cup of tea with the Phoenix Suns and everything else. But I, I think it's important now we shift to life. Even if I bring a mighty athlete on, ultimately I'm bringing it on to unpack life lessons. And you've learned and taught some mighty ones after basketball. So let's get into the plane. Let's fly up to Nebraska and let's start doing some work. What brought you to Nebraska a couple summers ago? 2020 was the last year I really kind of pursued playing basketball. For one, injuries, and then two, during the year of the pandemic overseas, it just, you had no idea where things were going to go. Like, they were pretty serious with their lockdown time. So I come back home in 2021, and I'm really just like, I think I'm ready to step away from the game for good. I'm tired of playing hurt, ready for whatever God has in, in mind for me. And I'm going to enjoy my family. I, I got involved a, a lot more in the church here in Jacksonville. Like, I reconnected with my wife. I got the job with the SEC Network. So it was just like blessing on top of blessing that year. Got engaged in December. My wife and I, we actually met each other at University of Florida. She's from Nebraska. And we just had so much time after basketball season was over to prepare for the wedding date we had, which was July 9th. I decided I wanted to spend time with her and her family in Nebraska. I found something else I wanted to do out there to pass time to work. Then I started working with an irrigation company. And I really enjoyed it. It was something I could do to, that was different than my regular type work. Get my hands dirty, get up early, come back home after a long day. And maybe two weeks was June 29th, where it was just a casual day uh, out there on the job. And at the blink of my eyes, the truck I was driving flipped over. Didn't have my seatbelt on. Thank God the vehicle only flipped over one time. But on that one time, I braced myself for the impact when that truck was going to land. And that was the worst thing I could do because when the truck with all that force landed back on all fours, all that pressure went into my shoulder blade and then a pop in my back. And it was so surreal, John, just as the truck was flipping, I was just like, this isn't real. And uh, before I know it, the truck's on all fours and, Immediately, I knew something was wrong because I had no feeling of my legs. It was the most insane thing I ever experienced. Were you in pain? A little bit, not a lot. Gradually, it started getting worse. Initially, I felt a little discomfort in my shoulder blade. I had bru bruised some ribs, fractured one. So somehow, you don't have your seatbelt on, but you get your phone. You're unable to move your legs waist down. You're raced off to the hospital. You spend more than 100 days in hospital. At what point were you told that you had this fracture, that you had this injury, and they thought that you weren't going to walk again? They life flighted me to South Dakota, and I can't remember the doctor necessarily saying anything in that moment, but I just remember when I saw Whitney hmm. walk in, just 
all the emotions. She's crying. I'm crying. We're devastated in the moment because we just knew at that moment that life was going to be different. And uh, um, man, thinking about it now, kind of. I'm curious what, because I have a question lined up, but I don't want to ask it. I feel like you're thinking about something. I'd love to be invited in. Man, I'm just, I'm thinking about just her and I, because sadly she and I were separated. Our dream and our vision just kind of being in a sense crushed in that moment. Separating is, is months, months down the road, but it's just so difficult because that's something that I still do grieve. Just thinking about what I really wanted for her and I to have together. And the accident I had was 10 days before our wedding day. And I still love the woman to death and she loves me. It's just, we jumped into it without being able to reassess, okay, what is life going to look like for us moving forward? Because we went through all the premarital counseling and all those things in this vision originally that we have for our life. And I know there's going to be people on both sides that say, you did the right thing, you did the wrong thing. I believe in my heart that we did the best with what the information we had at the time. But looking back, I just wish we would have taken it slow. Like that is when you talked about taking it slow, that is an area in decision making, being slow there, getting counsel, having people around that can say, let's take a minute and think about this for a second. So yeah, that's why, yeah, I got a little emotional kind because of, I haven't thought about that moment in a while of what that moment meant moving forward and us having that realization that I may not be able to walk again and have the life that we wanted. And even still, and that's phraseology I borrow from you, even if you still made a commitment to each other in the midst yeah. of the storm, in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of yes. the ability to wiggle the toes back then. Yes. You still committed, hey, I may not be on the altar with you, but uh, we're going to go forward with this thing. Yes. Without a doubt, you don't realize how prideful you are as a man until you have a wife and a kid. And not only that, then add on top me struggling with my masculinity, me struggling with my identity, me struggling with not being able to dance with my wife, me struggling with the realization I couldn't help with moving in or moving out and putting furniture there. And it, it's just too much for two people to jump into something without resolving trauma. Mm. You have this event, you lose almost your life but to this point in your life afterwards the ability to walk you talked about struggling with masculinity oh, trying to move into a house trying to figure out how to use the restroom because you can no longer yep. use what you used to trying to yep. figure out diet because it's no longer the way it used to be yep trying to you're no longer in quotes the athlete that you were like able to get through airports the way you were able to walk with your girl the way you were able to dance with your future wife the way you expected so life is completely upside down. And then you just said a moment ago, and I believe God was going to use it for good. So I'm curious, did you believe that? Were there nights where you would go to bed thinking, my gosh, this is a train wreck and it's never going to get better? Of course. Of course, there was the five steps of grief, denial, then anger. It was surreal. Like, gosh, is this really happened to me? No way I'm not going to be able to do this again. And Man, is this my real reality? Whitney and I were playing one of those conversation starters games in the hospital who we were newlyweds. And a card came up and the question was, what would you title this season of your life? And I looked at her after a moment. And I said, do you believe? <laughs> like, do you believe God is who he says he is? And do you believe what God said about you is true, says about you is true, that you know, looking at the, you know, <laughs> the one scripture that really I've held on to this day, I usually sign it in every book that I get a chance to is James 1, 2 through 3 to, <laughs> dear brothers and sisters, consider it an opportunity for pure joy when faced with trials of various kinds. What in the world? An opportunity for pure joy? For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance? And when that comes to completion, when it comes to the end, when you are able to look on the other side of that thing that you've gone through, you will come complete lacking in nothing. And I'm like, I'm not going to be complete lacking in nothing, but I know if I can get to a point where I consider it pure joy, if God says, this is where joy is found, joy is found in the struggle, joy is found when you don't have the answers and the unknown, so, you know, I'm going to put it to the test. 
And maybe I need to redefine what joy is. Maybe joy is not the way that the world has been describing it. I've never had more joy, but being with my parents at home, being with the dogs. I got a dog I've had since college. He's a, he's an old man now, but he brings me so much just simple joy. So I found that joy is found in the simple. Instead of me focusing on these things that I can't do and what's lost, joy was found in me being able to go outside for 15 minutes to get sunlight. And I lose track of that sometimes still, John. I'm a human being like anybody else. But when I get back to that and can see the good and just me saying, you know what, I'm going to show up. Things are harder. Things are different. But I'm going to show up. Literally the other day, I went to one of my favorite little sports bars here in Jacksonville, saw a buddy of mine. He and I chatted for a while, and he said, Patrick, just you being here, just you showing up. And I'm like, yeah, man, it's nice. He's like, no, 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 no. You being here in your chair, having a good time, hanging out, yeah. it means so much. And I'm just like, dude, I guess we really don't realize the impact we have on other people when we just show up. Yes. But not fake a smile on our face, but when they see that we actually are happy. When you're not happy, when you're human, when you're struggling with your bowel movements, when you're struggling with your diet, when you're struggling with isolation, when you're struggling with loss of relationship, loss of physicality, man, loss of life that you had. What, I cry. Tell, tell me what you do. Because like- I cry. I think all of us are there from time to time in our days and certainly in our lives. So what do you do when you're struggling? <laughs> I cry, that's one. Therapy is huge. Therapy is huge because sometimes you do need somebody that doesn't know you or that's that kind of removed from the situation that you can talk to helping me to sometimes go back to what can you control? What responsibility or ownership can you take to make this situation better? Because I can't control what other people are doing, being aware of my thoughts, you know, really realizing that, and John Gordon does a great job of this, you know, the negative thoughts are not coming from me. They're in there, but I don't have to address them. I don't have to accept them. I need to do it much better, but praying, man, just surrendering. And then also one of the biggest things, John, is allowing myself to be sad, mm. allowing myself to feel grief, allowing myself, instead of trying to block those things, I don't let those things, let myself linger in them. You, you do need to have like a kind of structure to help you combat that sadness or those real emotions. And if you can't be real about where you are and accept that, hey, I do actually feel sad today. How can I get out of that? Even if it's an improvement of 1%, that's a great improvement versus where you were. Do you believe you're going to be walking again someday? I believe it. I have hope. What's so good about having faith is that you can have a mustard seed of faith. And that's exactly where even if comes from. Even if it doesn't happen, even if it doesn't happen the way I want it, even if it doesn't happen in the time frame that I want it, even if it doesn't happen at all, mm -hmm. I'm still going to put my faith in God and faith and belief and determination within myself that I'm going to maximize this life, that I'm going to make the most out of the platform I'm given because I already have the evidence. There was one man. When I first spoke, I was not ready to go out and speak. It, this was November of that same year, but I went and did it. And I wasn't refined at the time. This was my first like kind of professional speaking engagement. A year later, I get to go do so this past November. After I finished speaking, this gentleman is waiting to come talk to me. And long story short there, he tells me last year he wasn't in person, but he watched remotely. And he said, I saved his life. Because he had a method, a note, and a plan for how he was going to take his life that week. And he said, listening to you share your story, I did not take my life because of that. And I'm just like, speechless. He's crying. I'm crying, John. I'm just like, all right, there's so much good that comes from this. And I pray it's going to be a story of one day, 10 years down the road, I'm going to be walked. But I just realized that God has had such bigger plans. In the way this is going and i have no idea what the next five years are going to look like but i know what today looks like i know what tomorrow looks like i'm going to keep going from there man i wrote down a bunch of the quotes from your book and i won't read them all but you just spoke directly to two of them so here's one of the bullets i wrote down 
I'm going to choose joy regardless of my situations and circumstances. I want to be a good example for anyone, everyone that's going to face hardships, and that is everyone. So that idea of choosing joy in James 1, 2, and 3, pure joy, my friends. Uh, you spoke to that, you model it, and you just exude it in the way you speak. A second quote that I wrote down is, regardless of my circumstances, and I love this one, you say, I still love God. I know God still loves me, that he allowed this to happen to help me depend on him more and to realize that I don't have as much control, but he yeah. can still use me. Yeah. W would you speak on that for a moment? When you say, uh, I don't have that much control, but he can still use me. What do you what do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that speaks for itself, but we we oftentimes it's two sided because. People say there is an illusion of control that we have over our life that we think at times people do that things are going to just go this way. It's just going to happen if I just will it together. But then you realize when something doesn't happen in the way you want, you fail a mishap, something out of your control that did, you know, this person didn't do their job or whatever, that thing's delayed. You're just like, dang, that wasn't supposed to happen. Right. When I was in the hospital last year, I was struggling at first. You know, I didn't think I was going to be in there that long. And I was frustrated so much out of my control, the past, the future, the results other people's opinion, other people's attitude, what others think about me, other people's feelings, other, other, other out there can't do anything about that. In my control, my response, my self-awareness, my thinking patterns. This is a huge one right here because people don't think it affects them as much as it does. The media we consume, John. Amen. What are you listening to? What are you watching? Oh, the lyrics aren't that bad. Oh, I'm telling you, the media you consume, it will affect your heart in the way that you speak and the way that you think. How I treat others, my self-talk, my words, and my belief. When I realized that I had so much more control over my hospital stay as far as how it was going to go, and I wasn't perfect at this, the same way I wasn't perfect with after Coach Donovan had to call me out and respond after that, but I realized the things I was watching in the hospital, am I wasting my time? Am I actually trying to put things into my mind to encourage me? How I treated the nurses and the doctors and the people that came in there? my words, my belief, my thinking, trying to just self-awareness was a huge one because I used this thing called a feelings wheel that helped me just to identify exactly where I was emotionally that day. And it's not always big things we need to do to change. The smallest things, when we do the smallest things to take an intention about what we are seeing, if it, it makes a huge difference, mm. huge that my responses, it changed everything for me. Well, it's so ironic because almost all of us live outside of that circle. Yeah, I know. We live in other people's responses to us and we live by what the media tells us Trump said or Biden did or is yep. happening in the Middle East or what happened yesterday or might happen tomorrow. It's everything that has utterly no, we have utterly no control over, none. And you remind us through your life and through your words and through your beautiful example that life can sometimes tip us over and we end up upside down and we can lose a lot along the way, but we can't lose the ability to navigate what our next right step forward is. Yeah. That, that is power, man. When you, yeah, that's it. Next step. What is it? So what, tell, tell us what, 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 what as you look ahead at your next step, what, what's next for you as you have so well, many opportunities, but also so many struggles that you're dealing with each day. Right. Well, one thing after talking to my therapist a, a minute back, we talked about, I love this phrase, maximizing the moment. How do we maximize the moment or maximize the season? I'm in a season in life right now where living with my parents, they're my main caretakers. They help me out a lot. In the Bible and scripture, it says to honor your mother and father. And it doesn't say honor your mother and father until they are gone, until they are this, you're this age. And I'm looking at ways, how can I do that daily, intentionally, honor and love them? My dad loves playing cards. There's certain things that he loves to do. You know, I can have this mindset because one day I am, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be back independent, back on my own, doing my own thing. But instead of focusing on, oh, I can't wait till that day comes, you know, I'm going to miss out on the moment. I'm not going to maximize it. I'm going to waste it. So SEC basketball is coming up in the fall. Can't wait for that. I don't know what else is next, John. It, it, you alluded to it and said it like this is right now is a season of kind of slowing down a little bit yeah. and really trying to build that foundation up again. Consider a pure joy, Patrick Young. You have 
considered a pure joy. And you're going to be bearing the fruits of that. I think it's going to be producing great fruit in your books, in your work, in your broadcast. I think you're going to touch so many lives as a broadcaster. I was watching you before the in event and then subsequently afterwards. And I think you're far more beautiful today than you were before. There's a whole there, a dime a dozen, man, for good looking athletes who are knowledgeable about the game they once played. Yeah. That's everywhere. To see a guy who's knowledgeable and charismatic about the game he once played in a world and neutral, grounded. You gotta, you gotta be neutral. <laughs> You're relatively neutral, man. Relatively. I, I I need you to back my Billikens up. Okay, it's been a while since we've been in the tournament, but we're, we're coming back this year, man. So Which, who? Don't don't play that card with me, man. St. This Louis, Louis oh. University Billikens, the powerhouse of They're the, the Billikens. I did not know that was the, it was the. We, we have seven questions that we wrap every conversation with. They are called the Live Inspired Seven. And I've had some amazing athletes and amazing overcomers, and you happen to be both. So question number one for you is, what's been the most meaningful book you've ever read? Can I say two? The Four Agreements. Yeah. And then The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. That I read that book when I was in the hospital after the initial part of the accident. And it was another thing that, gave me such inspiration that this obstacle is the way to get to where I want to go. What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possess as a little kid that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Is innocence an answer? <laughs> yeah, I would say I, I miss that just childlike innocence that you have where you kind of just look at the world with a fresh new eye and without judgment. I think our experiences have affected the way that we view things, especially as adults and not being able to always appreciate the purity of whatever that experience may be. If your home caught fire, the one you're currently in with your sweet parents. My dog. No, but the dog's out already, Ben. You have an opportunity of rolling back in now and maybe one day running back in and grabbing one item. What's that one physical item you would run in and grab? What a question. Dang, man. I don't care about any of those trophies. I mean, I don't care about the rings, but the rings, they might not melt. I can always get another Bible. I'm trying to think of something that's that you can't replace. Dang, should have given me a gave me a heads up on this one. The background of the question is my sister, when I was on fire, went back into the house to grab water. And there's such beauty. Like you hear your whole life is burning. You, everything you thought was valuable when you woke up that morning is now burning. And the thing you risk your life for is water to save your brother. And so me, like just that being being saved through her love has always reminded me of the things that are ultimately worthy in life. And it's not the things we thought we should be pursuing this morning when we woke up usually. Yeah. So other things we've heard in the past, like I, I interviewed a woman who ran a billion dollar business. This was an extremely wealthy lady. And she talked about going in to get grab a, a plastic statuette. And I'm like, why wouldn't she just let, you know, go buy a new one? And she said, John, I came from nothing. And uh, that little cross in our kitchen reminded me of what mattered to my mother and her mother and should remind me of what matters to me. And I, 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 that's what I would risk my life for. And Brene Brown, who we've had on the show, talked about going in to grab a, a wooden cross. And she said it was made from the cribs of my children. So all the, all, when wow. the children grew the cribs, they, they turned those wooden cribs into wooden cross, a wooden cross that hangs on the wall. And it reminds her not only of her faith, but of the, the journey of guiding kids out of those cribs. And yeah, wow. It, it's not, it's not the stuff you buy at Target or insurance will have a tough time covering. It's the intrinsical stuff that, man, I would hold on to this and know I could rebuild my life. Oh, probably the photo book. Obviously you can't recreate those things. The ones, you know, our, my family lineage, that's something without a doubt I'd want to run in and grab. I'm going to, this is such a good question that I'm going to, I might have to text you and say, okay, John, I changed my answer. Well, for right now, we're going out with the photo albums and yeah. later you text me, I'll drop it back in. So okay. stay tuned okay. audience. What about this question? If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? More than likely, it would not be an athlete. I want to be someone that is going through struggle and someone else that's an overcomer, someone that was an innovator. The first person would be Martin Luther King that comes to my mind. But there's definitely others that go far before him. Mm. But, I mean, you can't 
Who's going to say, oh, that's such a dumb answer, Martin Luther King? Who, who would say that? I had his son on our <laughs> podcast, Martin the Third, uh, sat in the same spot you did. And and he also, I think, chose his dad. My mother was the very first person I interviewed on the Live Inspired podcast. She's episode 000. And she would have chosen Martin Luther King. So uh, I think you're in, you're in great company. For great you company. I'm good. Good, <laughs> good to know. What's the best advice, King? Or your coach in high school, college, your parents, a friend, best advice you've ever received. So the best advice Patrick Young has ever received is? The first thing that comes to mind is I was connected to Inky Johnson last year. I talked to him like 15, 20 minutes. And he shared with me just during that time. And this probably, this could have been a little bit after I listened to your podcast too, your interview with, of like, you don't know who you're affecting while you're on your journey. Right. You just showing up, pursuing this dream, having a smile on your face, getting after it. What advice would you give yourself at age 20? You are enough and you don't need to try to fit in because you attract the wrong people when your focus is only on trying to be liked, approval from others. So yeah, Patrick, you are enough. If you... Be who you are. Don't worry about trying to fit in with other people and doing what they're doing. And you will attract the right people around you. Patrick Young, you've run the gauntlet, my friend. We're down to the final question. And it is, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Squeeze every ounce out of this life. I want to squeeze every ounce of potential and this life to the fullest, the life that I've been given. Mm -hmm. Patrick Young, you are squeezing every ounce out of this life and you are rolling around today and one day running forward in the future with such yeah. joy that it reminds the rest of us what remains possible in our lives too. It's, you're an incredible example, man, and, the, and a model that truly the best is yet to come. Thank you. family, friends, leaders, if you enjoyed today's episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, you will love the conversation I had a couple years back with my buddy, Chris Norton. Chris is a remarkable guy. He's a good friend of mine. After becoming paralyzed while playing NCAA football, Chris was determined to one day, in spite of everyone's belief against it, that he would stand, he would rise, he would walk, and against doctor's orders, this gentleman not only was able one day to walk across the graduation stage and accept that diploma, but he was able to hear the words, I do, to echo those words himself, to take his bride's hand and to walk down the wedding aisle with her. It's a stunning, miraculous story. You are going to love it. So check it out. The story, that determination, that faithfulness, that love with Chris Norton can be tuned in by either listening to episode 43 with him or when I brought him back on to the Live Inspired Couch and we chatted about his life since that conversation at episode 165. We'll, of course, have links to both of those in the show notes. You can go there by visiting me online at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. Family, the way we expand our impact is by sharing with our friends what we tune into. So if you have benefited from this program, we don't ever charge you for it. The only ask we make is that you not only live the messages through your life, but that you share it with others who might benefit from it. So where you work, where you worship, where you work out, where you do life, let them know that you tune into the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary, and so should they. So friends, for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. What a gift. Live Inspired. You know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started.
You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at KeeleyCompanies.com.